The point of this content is to show why multitasking benchmarks are wholly unreliable, difficult to execute, and ultimately uninformative unless controlled to a point of becoming a quote-unquote normal benchmark. There's something here we can work with for the future, maybe, but our first attempt at multitasking benchmarking largely demonstrates why no one really does this. Mainly, it's not reliable and variance between tests produces unexpected, read, wrong results. We're looking at the G4560 and R3-1200 today, testing under conditions of gaming while running video playback and other bloatware. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by the EVGA 1080 Ti SC2 and NVIDIA Destiny 2 bundle running up through September 4th. The 1080 Ti SC2 comes with asynchronous fan control for its dual fans, nine thermal sensors, and again includes Destiny 2. Learn more at the link in the description below. Patrick headed up the test planning and execution for this content. I worked with him on a lot of it. And he'll be joining me at the end of this video to talk about some of the testing procedures he went through, things that we found inadequate or things that we thought might potentially give us an option for the future. But the thing is, this is the kind of testing we do behind the scenes to build a new test plan. We don't normally publish this type of data, but the idea here is to answer the very highly requested community question of, can you test multitasking? Which, depending on which person you're speaking with, that meant a lot of different things. So. We introduced stream benchmarking alongside gaming, and that was a way of doing multitasking benchmarks, but for some folks that was too much multitasking. So people wanted other things that were maybe more normal, so to speak. Things like Discord or Chrome, or video playback, or music playback, or running Steam, Uplay, Origin, stuff like that. So that's what we're visiting today. And the point of publishing this is to demonstrate why it's hard to trust these multitasking benchmarks and why we haven't quite figured it out yet because there's just there are so many variables when you start introducing the real world scenarios that everyone requests turns out pretty much all the real world scenarios involve internet attached applications which do whatever the heck they want a lot of the time to the point of really throwing off results and we have examples of those where in some cases the ryzen 3 cpu was just getting destroyed in numbers but not because it was actually bad, just because some application decided to fire off some kind of background task while we were benchmarking. And that's why you don't run tests with those things in the background normally. But uh, you can try to, and if you're able to get these things to, well, one, work with applications that don't just randomly spawn more services or randomly start downloading stuff or start doing whatever in the background it is that they do, if you can figure that out, then you might have a multitasking benchmark but it starts looking more and more like a normal test as you stray from the internet attached applications that everyone wants us to test. Like again, Steam, Battle.net, Chrome, all that type of thing. So in listening to the community questions and thoughts from a while ago and throughout the last several CPU reviews, we've learned that a lot of people think things like uh, Discord plus gaming is multitasking or that Skype plus gaming is multitasking. It kind of at the purest definition of it, it is, but for the folks who say that they're seeing performance differences that are noticeable from running Discord or Skype while playing a game, there is something seriously wrong with your computer if you're seeing that even on a G4560. That is not an intensive workload. So we're looking at something in the middle. We're not looking at just one application, Discord or Skype, because it's pointless. But if you look at stuff like uh, a bunch of bloatware all at once, then you start developing a real test. So we're doing that. We have another test where we tried to do video playback with a 4K video while gaming, and then tried logging the 4K video's playback performance while logging the gaming performance, because if you just take one of them, you don't get the full picture. Maybe the game does perfectly fine, but the video is dropping frames. So we tried that as well, uh, but have more to work with. What we didn't do is the I keep 100 tabs of Chrome open test, because Chrome also seems to do whatever it wants. We looked at it. The thing is, Chrome does all kinds of caching. It deactivates tabs sometimes when they're not in use. You have dynamic page elements, like advertisements that just kind of fire off whenever. And sure, you can address some of these problems in testing by getting an ad blocker or by trying to avoid things like YouTube and Twitch. But then again, we're straying from real world scenarios that people are interested in. So you really might as well just use a local application. But even those are problematic, as we'll show you. Uh, so Chrome, not a good benchmark for a lot of reasons. But as we look through this other stuff, we learned that it's not alone in being not a good benchmark for a lot of reasons. So here's what we've got for the bloatware test. This one includes game clients, Blizzard or Battle.net or whatever they call it now, mixed with Origin, Uplay, and Steam all open simultaneously. 
monitoring software, so Hardware Info 64 and MSI Afterburner with Hardware Info 64 logging actively every two seconds, chat clients like Discord in a call and Skype, peripheral software, NZXT Cam, Corsair Q, Logitech Gaming Software, and Overwolf, all of which had some sort of use, except Overwolf because we don't like it. Other than that, we had VLC with MP3 playback looping, and then all the tests were performed for a period of about two minutes with three passes for parity, just to figure out if this was even worth pursuing further for longer durations. So here's the problem. Something like half of these applications or more are internet attached, either silently or noticeably. They might be doing things in the background that we don't know about, unless you really sit there and look at it and monitor packets and things like that. So that's a problem. That's a, that means that you have a dynamic testing element to account for. And then uh, another thing is, if we get these benchmarks working in a satisfactory manner, we'd also have to look more at loss from baseline performance rather than exact, like absolute performance. Because if you're looking at an R3 and a G4560, the performance ultimately will be different because the performance should be different baseline in general. We picked a few games where it was about the same. But uh, what you care about is which one does it more efficiently. So what's your performance loss? What's the delta between a baseline test and a bloated test? Uh, so that's, that's one of the things we're looking at. This was our nuclear option. We ran it this way because just doing Discord in a game is not enough, but because people kept asking for internet attached application testing while gaming. So we've done basically all of them at this point and it should produce some kind of difference. So that's the base testing plan. We'll start with the video stuff, talk about why we scrapped it, and then go through the bloatware. Video testing was our starting point. The goal was to play a game while playing back one of our own 4K videos hosted locally and playing back on a secondary monitor, then using software to log game frame rate and video playback drop frames at the same time. VLC was used initially because it has an expansive options menu and it can count to dropped frames, but it also came with some issues. Out of the box, VLC was hitting nearly 100% CPU usage while watching a 4K video with these lower end CPUs and toggling some options in the codec section helped with that, but then the software was no longer stock. So you start straying from that scenario. In addition, there's a sample that we've got here of what it took to log a single benchmark run because it really wasn't trivial. Windowed mode is mentioned here because VLC was crashing when certain games were launched in full screen. Logging the frame rate of video playback was important as well, since one of the issues people experience is video choppiness, not just loss of frame rate in game. That meant two frame rate loggers on two windows at the same time, or relying on VLC's own drop frame meter. We considered switching to Windows Media Player, but detected playback of more than 60 frames per second on a 60 frame per second video, which indicates some kind of Microsoft or Windows Media Player shenanigans. After encountering so many issues with monitoring playback reliably while also playing back a video at 4K while gaming, video testing was shelled for the time being and we moved on. The next option was one that Patrick dubbed the, quote, nuclear option, including numerous viewer requested game clients, peripheral clients, and other background software. This we thought would surely draw out any differences between the G4560 and 1200 in these multitasking benchmarks. And again, we started this thinking that we might have an actually valid benchmark to look at performance differences between the two CPUs, but we left with low confidence in multitasking benchmarking in general without using local non-internet attached software. Let's start with Blizzard's client and why it is 100% unreliable for any type of benchmark while it's open. Beginning with expectations, most of you would agree that it is reasonable to assume one of two outcomes here. Either there's really no difference with the Battle.net client open and you have basically the same performance between the 4560 and the R3 1200 with no loss baseline versus Battle.net being open. This isn't loss between the two CPUs against each other. It's what is baseline performance of the CPU versus baseline with Battle.net open. That's what we're looking at. So it would one expectation is that there's no difference. The other expectation is that maybe there's a slight advantage for the R3 1200, but what you wouldn't expect is that the G4560 would perform 31% better than an R3 1200. I think we can all agree that's pretty unreasonable to assume, but that's what we saw, and it's because this type of testing is unreliable. Here's a chart. For anyone who skipped to this chart and bypassed all of the stuff I just said, you're not going to understand any of the numbers, and you're going to post a comment calling us shills. If you skipped the last few minutes, stop now, go back, because you're not going to understand the context, which is that this is not a valid benchmark. That's the whole point of this video. We've got a few main figures here. The G4560 baseline is 48.3 FPS with lows at 30.3 and 27.5. 
the R3-1200 is remarkably close by, with the two parts more or less tied and with invariance in the frame time department. When bloated with all of these applications, which we'll show on the screen once again, we lose 4 FPS on the G4560, that's average, dropping 8% in performance, and they hit the frame times as a bit worse, illustrated by 1% and 0.1% lows here. Here's a surprise though. The R3-1200 drops 11 FPS, or 24%, and now suffers with halved 0.1% lows that align with more stutter. Clearly something went wrong here. We started disabling applications, ultimately finding that Battle.net was the culprit and decided to do something in the background during the R3 test that it did not do in the background during the G4560 tests. Solving for this bumps the R3-1200 up to G4560 performance once again, with the two more or less tied when we axe Battle.net from the R3. Again, these are not definitive benchmarks. We're not telling you that one CPU is better than the other or even that they're tied. What we're showing you is the results from different test passes with an R3, 1200, and a G4560, and why it doesn't really make sense on the numbers you get sometimes, and that's because of the variance. That's why we don't do these tests normally. I'd like to do them because it is so heavily requested, but we're not gonna be able to do these benchmarks with the applications everyone wants to see benchmarked. Battle.net's behavior here could also explain other weird frame deltas when you have Battle.net open while benchmarking something like Overwatch or any other game that they have on there. So it's just kind of a weird application that throws issues to begin with. Let's go to Metro Last Light. Again, we're looping tests for about two minutes with three loops each time. Here is Metro Last Light's benchmark between the same two CPUs. Baseline, we've got the G4560 at about 84 FPS and the R3-1200 at about 85 FPS. We chose this benchmark because they were so close in performance with lows more or less equal. The 4560 drops to 75 FPS average with bloatware or about 10% performance loss. The R3-1200 drops 31% of its average performance, again, because of completely unpredictable internet-attached software in the form of Battle.net doing things in the background. And, of course, other software too. It's not just Battle.net. Disabling Battle.net gives a more proportional loss, as you can see in the bloatware without Battle.net results. And who knows what other software was responsible for performance that we saw. We got lucky in disabling Blizzard's client, finding that it had issues and kind of moving ahead. But the thing is, retesting the R3-1200 with Battle.net, sometimes its numbers look fine. Other times, it's a loss. Same is true for the G4560. It's just a matter of what was going on, what was Blizzard doing, what was the client doing when you ran the test. Here's Ash's escalation, where we see a 1 to 2 FPS loss with bloatware, though the G4560 ran Blizzard's Battle.net and the R3 did not in this test. So again, this isn't a test you can rely on for comparative data between the two, aside from showing that we saw little performance loss in this particular title, with the applications doing whatever they were doing when we had them on in the background. And this brings up another challenge with multitasking benchmarking, or what we're calling multitasking benchmarking. Because this game is so taxing on the CPU anyway, because it is commanding all of the CPU resources from AMD and Intel, we now have an issue where Ashes clearly is more or less the same performance, but what's happening in the background applications? What are they dropping? that we don't know about to try and make sure and keep up with ashes. Well, the thing is, you can look at some of that, for example, logging applications. In the past, we've noticed that ADA64 will drop log intervals when it is incapable of keeping up with the performance. For example, running Furmark with Prime95 and keeping ADA64 in a normal priority in Task Manager means that ADA64, with the hardware we were testing on when we do this, will drop intervals. So you'll, instead of an interval every second, you'll get an interval at second one, an interval at second 19, at 22, at 37. It's kind of random, and you're dropping performance in that application, ADA64, but maybe not the other ones. So that's another really difficult thing you have to keep an eye out for is ADA or hardware info, those are easier. You produce a log file, you check the interval average, and you know if it was logging the whole time or not. But what about things like video playback software? Now you need either another frame monitor that you know is accurate for video playback or an application that logs drop frames. Okay, you can figure that out. What about the other software? What about music playback or stream playback if you're trying to work with Chrome or something like that? There are all these things. It's not just monitoring the game. It's monitoring everything else and trying to figure out where is the performance loss occurring, especially when you start accounting for things like Windows, which schedules stuff in ways that should theoretically be beneficial to the user, but 
it's not the same between Intel and AMD, so that's hard too. Here's one more, Rocket League, where we've again got roughly equal performance to start, which was an intentional choice, and then a gap of about 8% when we use the bloatware. But here's the thing with this one. We have no idea if we're getting game priority on the G4560 and some negative effect to the background software, or if the R3-1200 is genuinely just slower, or if there's some sporadic and unpredictable background process firing off as a result of all the game clients and internet attached applications trying to do stuff. And at the end of the day, this test means nothing. Data is not reliable. We could make AMD win or Intel win just by running the test enough times that one of them has some terrible thing going on in the background to tank the performance, as we saw with Ryzen in that particular set of tests with Battle.net. So the alternative to that is you could, as a tester, not know that something just happened, publish those results, and then you end up with results that make a, a huge disparity between two components that might only exist because something started occurring, like maybe a download or maybe some kind of auto video playback in one of the clients you're working with that starts tapping into the CPU for some kind of encoding process, whatever. Something like that could go on in one of the applications, depending on what you're using. So it requires very careful selection of applications and then some way to monitor the performance of those applications as well, if it's a video playback or music playback or something like that. So a lot of trouble there. It's easy to overlook a difference caused by a background result that was not the case for the other product. And it's easy to just have applications that for whatever reason are scheduled differently between tests. So very difficult to do this kind of benchmarking and ideally you do it with stuff that's not internet attached. So the next step to this would be we ditch all of these game clients, especially Battle.net, and start doing stuff with Excel. You can make Excel enumerate or iterate through some formula ad infinitum and just sit there and process a formula nonstop while you play a game. Okay, and then at the end of it, you look at how far did Excel get? What was the frame rate of the game? You compare the two numbers. Unfortunately, that's not really something people do too much. I, certainly there are people who do that, but our audience, probably not so much. And ultimately the comments we would get for doing something like that would be, this isn't a real world test. We want real world multitasking benchmarking. So you're back to the original problem of here's something that's kind of synthetic we've created to simulate multitasking benchmarking, although it is technically a real multitasking thing. It's just, does anyone do it or care about it? You could do that, but it doesn't satisfy the demand, which is for more normal applications. So you look at Excel, you make it iterate numbers, you look at some media player that's trustworthy in its drop frame logging or some other way to log it, uh, doesn't crash like VLC was doing under certain conditions. You find something like that, maybe there's something there to test. But it starts looking more and more like a normal test environment and not the scenario that people want to see, which is unfortunate because we'd love to fill that demand. It's just, it's not easy. And we don't want to publish numbers for something that clearly has so much variance and, and we have no confidence in what's going on in the background. If I could look at it and know something happened that didn't happen in the other test, and by something happened, I mean one of the applications pinning a server or tapping into the CPU a different way. If we could look at it and identify that reliably without investing an absurd amount of effort, and I mean, we're willing to invest effort, but there is a reasonable amount that you can do. If that were the case, we'd run the tests. But until that point, there's really no point in running them. So this is why we don't test with that many variables. We tried this content piece started out with the hopes we would do an actual G4560 versus R3-1200 over, uh, overclocking, overtasking benchmark, we'll call it. But it just didn't turn out that way. It turned into a content piece of this is why this thing's hard to do with the applications we used. Uh, and then besides, most people who talk about feeling a faster or smoother response in just Windows after changing CPUs, it's probably because you reinstalled Windows unless you went from something like a garbage Celeron up to literally anything else. So uh, that's another thing to consider is, is a lot of the subjective user feeling of responsiveness comes from things like SSDs, or if that was already in there, then reinstalling Windows. But uh, that's enough of my thoughts on it. We're gonna get Patrick on for a minute to talk through some of his testing and see what he thinks about the future of trying to do something like this now that we've learned a bit and, uh, and then we'll close it out. Okay, so I've got Patrick on now 
Patrick ran the tests, figured out how to do most of them. Let's start with that. Let's start with what was, going back to the video stuff, what was the process to start and adequately execute all the logging for video while gaming? We wrote this down in the article uh, in a little more detail, but basically what I was having to do is have the video open on one monitor, the game open on another monitor, switch the video to be the active window so that Fraps would detect it, set the game as the process that PresentMon was detecting, hit a key combination to start logging with Fraps and PresentMon, hit play on the video, tab back into the game, and start benchmarking the game and do all of that within a reasonable amount of time so that the benchmarks would be synced up and so that we wouldn't be logging frame rates before or after the benchmark because then we get really weird 0.1% lows. Right. Um, and just like a really complicated process for something that isn't super important, really. I mean, like we, we want to log frame rate of both the video and the game because a lot of the issues that people have when multitasking are not just with the game but also like if they're watching a video if the video is playing back badly or right. the audio is skipping so we want to test for that as well but then adding that to the benchmark makes it exponentially more difficult well, and also and we could deal with the difficulty but then you have stuff like one is fraps or present monitor or whatever monitoring the video application even accurate yeah like, is it even a frame output that is realistic or what's occurring on screen. And then also, they probably at some level conflict with each other. Yeah. Like, I've, I've definitely run tests in the past accidentally that we figured out were run uh, incorrectly where I've had PresentMon and Fraps logging the same game. And you'll see it because the numbers don't look right. So that's a question. Uh, we had VLCs uh, drop frame output too. So VLC does have a feature where it will display dropped frames, and that's a pretty useful feature if what you're doing is watching VLC. But when you're doing multiple things at the same time and the video isn't the active window, we were getting playback that was stuttering but then not being reflected in the dropped frame counter. I think we pretty much dropped VLC after that point. I don't know. Right now, my feeling is I just generally don't trust multitasking benchmarks with a lot of the applications people want us to test because they're like like battle.net is internet attached yeah and we saw 30 percent performance loss <laughs> like for who knows what reason yeah there, there was some pretty weird stuff and just the the nature of the test makes the test difficult i mean people that are talking about difficulties with multitasking they're talking about unpredictable behaviors and weird unpredictable behaviors aren't lab friendly right uh they're they're hard to test for they're hard to account for and they're hard to reproduce this isn't us complaining saying this is hard feel bad for us this is saying like this is what everyone wants to see and we want to see it too that's why i just paid patrick for like a week to try and do this <laughs> is uh, we we want to see these tests i'd like to do them i'd love to be one of the only sites that has the way of doing them and you know a trustworthy fashion Unfortunately, until we can really figure out key applications that are both representative of what users want and friendly to benchmarking processes where you know what's going on and there's not variance, until we can figure those applications out uh, and everyone agrees that they're good to test, then we don't have multitasking tests for you that are anything beyond today, which was like, here's an exploratory look at it. Because uh, otherwise, like I was saying, before we cut in with Patrick, you can do stuff like we talked about using Excel to just enumerate some formula. Yeah. That would be reliable. Does it count? I mean, we are just not comfortable with the level of accuracy that we would get from doing like a, a casual benchmark with like just Chrome, like a YouTube video playing. We, I mean, we could do that pretty easily, but then we wouldn't be comfortable publishing results and, and standing by those. Um, yeah, it'd be trivial to yeah. do. <laughs> like, how do, you, how do you isolate the software from the network, from the OS, from the hardware? Because we want to isolate the hardware. <laughs> yeah. But network alone could be a big factor in things. So. At the end of the day, we, we don't want to say that the, the 1200 is a, a better or worse CPU than the G4560 based on this. I mean, for the, this task, yeah. yeah. Um, just 
a really complex question and uh, really a lot of variance in the answers to that question. Yep. And ultimately, if your form of multitasking is Discord, YouTube, your inbox, and playing a game, it's not going to matter which CPU you buy. Like, it will matter for other reasons for which we have the R3-1200 review. So you can check that out if you want those reasons. But that's all for this one. Thank you all for watching and for filing the request. Seriously, it's, it's very interesting to look into. We like knowing these things, even if we didn't come to the conclusion that I wanted, which was a real test that shows real differences that we could trust. Didn't get that today, but we still got interesting content and we have stuff we can work on for the future. So thank you for requesting it. If you want to leave comments with application suggestions for like video playback, maybe you know of one that is really good at logging its performance, please leave them below. We'll look into it for next time. But I think we're good for now. So thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus helps out directly. And we will see you all next time.